All right, so hi, welcome to class. We have a lot to cover today. We're not going to cover everything, probably. Um, but that's okay. Today is Tuesday, right? Today is Tuesday. Um, we're on the second part of neural tissue. Today in lab, we're going to do heart and blood stuff, which I realize we're a week ahead. But heart and blood stuff is actually cool to see in lab, right? So show up in person. If you're deeply uncomfortable with like pricking yourself and dripping blood on a slide, I have fake blood for you to use. But if you want to like know your blood type and look at yours, you'll need to do that. Yeah? Sweet. Okay. Neural tissue. And 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 I'm staying so on script. Like, like I went through your book. And I'm not going off on weird tangents. Like, there's a lot to cover, but it's, it's staying focused. Briefly, this is not the most important thing you'll ever learn in your life, but um, it's fast. Neurons get, the, the neurons themselves, so we talked about glia before, neurons, the cells' neurons, you can classify them a couple different ways. The most obvious way is to classify them based on what they look like. So when they've got... Over there in the far left, that's the classic example. Like, that's the quintessential neuron. It's called multipolar because it's got lots of sticky out bits, lots of processes. Um, all of those are dendrites except for one long axon. Yeah? The next, well, okay, so we've got multipolar. We have bipolar cells. They've got the cell body right in the middle. And those you see in very specific situations. You're going to see them a lot in sensory organs. Um, but what that is, it's basically one axon, one dendrite. And both axons and dendrites can branch, right? But, but it's bipolar because of the cell, and then two ends. You see this in vision a lot. You see it in the eye. And then pseudo-unipolar, or unipolar if you want to call it that, um, it's this weird looking shape where it's basically an axon. Um, you've got the cell body sticking out there. You have a few receptive endings, the axon. It's, it's basically an axon. Oh, right, I should have shown you a bigger thing. These come in different versions, right? So. Multipolar can be something like this, like a Purkinje cell. They're really pretty. They're in a cerebellum. And they look like those fan corals, if you've ever seen them. Like, it legitimately looks like that. Um, you also have pyramidal cells. I know it looks like, you say, pyramidal, it's pyramidal. Right, you have a whole bunch of different types. Um, bipolar cells, you can see in, say, the eye, the ear, the nose. And then these pseudo, you know, polar cells, you're basically only going to see them in the peripheral nervous system. That's okay. So you can classify it by what they look like. You can also classify them by what they do. And you can have, you can combine these things, right? So you can have sensory, so you can have multipolar, unipolar, um, bipolar cells. You can also have sensory ones, right? Sensory, sensory neurons, you're going to be okay. You're, you're good. Your face is also beautiful. Oh, I promise I've never like thrown anything hard at students. Um, I actually once upon a time went to like a teacher training thing. I go to these occasionally and they're like, you cannot throw things at students. Has this been a problem? Is this a problem? Anyways, we had like a whole thing about like, don't do that. I'm like, okay, I, I won't. Thanks. Also, I'm not supposed to like personally insult you. I'm like, good. Just how you do humans. Anyways, right, okay. Sensory, going towards the central nervous system. Motor, these neurons are carrying things away from the central nervous system. And then interneurons, or you can call it them association neurons, they're neither sensory nor motor. They're between sensory and motor. So a motor neuron is sending signals towards central nervous system. Um, interneurons are that gap in between. But okay. Not super interesting how to name them. This is where it gets interesting. Neurons are zappy, right? That's the not the technical term. 
okay? They're excitable. So, who here has taken physics? Oh, this is gonna be old news to all of you. Okay, if you've not taken physics, that's okay. It'll be new news to you. Um, okay, neurons have arresting membrane potential. Like, all cells do this, but neurons, we care about it. Most cells just have this resting membrane potential, and they just chill and do their thing. Neurons change theirs really, really fast. They're highly excitable. So, I hope Dr. Uh, I hope Sean never walks in and me explaining these things because we're just going to gloss over major physics concepts briefly. Opposite charges attract. Yeah. If you have opposite charges, you've got like a positive charge and negative charge. If they're separated, there's energy inherent in that system. So it's higher energy if, if your positive and negative charges are separated. If there wasn't a barrier, plus you, um, and they can come down, it'd go down to lower energy, right? It'd be a spontaneous process. With me there? Great. Um, so you give up energy when charges move towards each other. Um, if you have a system where the opposite charges are separated, you, you have a system that has potential energy in it. All right? It's like the idea of having bowling balls on high shelf. They might not be giving off energy right now, but if you can liberate that, it'll, it'll, it'll go. Right? Questions about this? Super fast. I realize this is a terrible slide, but just, just a couple words. You probably know them. Voltage is just measuring that potential energy that you have that's, that's separated there. Um, you, you've got charges that are separated. Voltage is how much oomph you've got there. Okay? Current is when you're looking at the flow of electrical charges. In biology, it's really nice because you can have both positives and negatives moving, whereas in physics, you just have to worry about negatives flowing. Um, that current can do stuff, it can do work, right? it can get things done. And then the resistance is how hard it is for charge to flow. So charge is trying to move around. The resistance is the, the thing or the, the, the physical properties that impede that. Everyone's cool with these? So if you're looking at the current, you're looking at how much this electric, how, how much how much this charge moves, you want to know basically, um, oh, the voltage, which you can think of almost like pressure, like water pressure, right? And you also want to know the resistance, which is what is this charge try, trying to move through? Is it trying to move through air? Is it trying to move through water? Like how, how, how much pushback does it get? Super brief, are we okay with this? Voltage, charge, resistance. Great. Don't memorize this whole thing. Don't frankly write down and give your hand cramps. Um, current voltage and resistance are all interrelated, right? So the current is proportionate to the voltage. So the higher the voltage, you're expecting the um, current to be greater. And the greater the resistance, the lower you're expecting the current to be. Um, that's great. What's important to us are these little guys. You've got channels. So we have, a, we have all these ions floating around that are carrying charge, and they're going to do things. The important things for us are neurons are going to have non-gated channels. They're called leak channels. They just, they just, they're always open. They're not very interesting because they're always open, and ions just leak back and forth, depending on which, which way they're supposed to go. Gated channels open and close, right? You can gate channels in three different ways. Um, you can gate them with chemicals. So this one, um, like you saw this in muscles, right? So acetylcholine acts on a ligand gated channel, right? So it's closed unless there's acetylcholine and then it opens. 
so far so good? That's almost, that's exactly the, the lock and key idea, right? So that you need the key to be open it up and open it up. You also saw in muscles, um, you saw voltage gated channels that a certain voltage they'll open. All right. And then you also have mechanically gated channels, which are going to change in response to actual physical pressure. So you have these for a bunch of sensory receptors, like in, in your ear, um, physical sound waves deform the membrane and that pushes on a channel and it legitimately opens. It just is, it's mechanically open. So do we, do we see these? Do we feel comfortable with these? Um, chemically gated ion channels, right? If the receptor doesn't have the um, appropriate ligand, the appropriate chemical, it's completely closed. If that chemical, and for, for us, if we're in the nervous system, these are neurotransmitters. If that neurotransmitter is there, then this channel is open. Yeah? Voltage gated, something like this. Um, it's closed, right, because of this part of the protein down here. If, if the inside of the membrane is negative, the protein is held down, right? If it's positive, these are pushed away and the channel opens. Yeah? Channels like this can be specific, right? So you, you could have a channel like the one over on the left that, yeah, okay, it's just obviously letting positive ions through. Um, this one over here looks like it's specific for sodium. Channels can be specific for different things if they have different types of way of opening. Um, and the mechanically gated cha channels, your book doesn't have a really good picture. I don't like your book's pictures. Um, oh... What happens with that one is, as you squeeze, it pops open, or as you squeeze, it pops closed. And then you let things through. Great. Now, the neuron, I realize we're just stopping now. So the neuron charge, has charges on both sides. There's, there's a resting membrane potential. When the, when the neuron's not doing anything else, it's got this potential difference. So, if you open channels, any of these type of channels, ions move quickly. So they're moving in response to two things. They're going to move in response to their chemical concentration gradients. Right, so if, if you have a ton of, say, sodium on one side and uh, not very much on this side, sodium is going to go down its chemical concentration gradient. Yeah? They're also going to move in response to their electrical gradient. So if there's a whole bunch of positive charges, they're going to move away from that towards the negative charges, right? And this can get tricky because you need to combine them both into what's called an electrochemical gradient. So let me draw on the board briefly. Well, let's draw on the board. And then you're going to be torn between laughing or being pathetic, and it'll be challenging for everybody. Okay. Just a sec, let's see if this is viewable. Okay. If we have, say, let's have sodium. This is so not even viewable. Oh yeah, that, you can see that. Okay. You have sodium here, right? Down its chemical gradient, it would be going this way. Cool. Down its electrical gradient, it would be going this way. Also cool. If you had a whole bunch of, say, potassium on this side, Down sodium's chemical gradient, it still, it still wants to follow it, right? But down its electrical gradient, it doesn't because there's more positive charges on this side. So the competing forces sum together, and there's actually very specific ways you can figure out what they sum to. Yeah? Sorry, 
I do. I do like this stuff, so ask me questions if you're like, you're going too fast. Uh, this is just the same thing. Okay. What sets up everything for the neuron is what's called the resting membrane potential. That's when the neuron's not doing anything else, it's just chilling. And the inside, the cytoplasmic side, is negatively charged relative to the outside. The membrane gets called, it gets called being polarized because there's, there's this negative charge relative to the outside charge. Depending on the specific neuron, it could be anywhere from like, I don't know, negative 35, negative 40, up to like negative 90, which is huge. But for us, it's going to be negative 70. Negative 70 millivolts. Um, and it's going to look like this. So you've got relative to the, in, relative to the outside, the inside's got more negative charge. Yeah? So if you do this little thing where you drop a voltmeter in, which you did with your little cuttlefish friend on your lobster thing, yeah. Um, those of you that saw her, we'll figure it out. Talk to me in lab. Um, it reads negative. Great. So far, so good. That by itself is not interesting. The interesting bit is, well, okay. Setting stuff up. The extracellular fluid has a lot of sodium outside, and the intracellular fluid has a bunch of potassium. Um, does this play? It does play. I have a brief video for you. When I checked it, it played, but then I don't always trust if things won't work. Okay, is that loud enough? Okay. Ah. I mean, I can't remember else, but she's part of this back. The human brain alone contains about 100 billion nerve cells called neurons. A neuron, like all cells, has negatively and positively charged ions in the fluids located both inside and outside of the cell. However, the ionic composition of these two fluids is markedly different. The inner surface of the membrane is negatively charged, while the outer surface is positively charged. This unequal distribution of charge creates a voltage across the plasma membrane, known as the membrane potential. In a resting, unstimulated neuron, this membrane potential is known specifically as the resting membrane potential. The value of the resting membrane potential depends on two factors. The first is the presence of concentration gradients across the plasma membrane, especially those gradients for sodium and potassium ions. The second is the permeability of the plasma membrane to sodium and potassium. In the resting state, this permeability depends on the number of non-gated leak channels present in the membrane for these ions. The magnitude of the resting membrane potential inside relative to outside is measured in millivolts using a voltmeter and two electrodes. We'll now place both electrodes in the extracellular fluid. Note that the voltmeter records zero voltage. This is because the unequal distribution of charge exists only across the plasma membrane. The intra and extracellular fluids are otherwise electrically neutral. However, when we insert one of the electrodes into the intracellular fluid, a voltage is recorded. The value of the resting membrane potential varies, but on average it is minus 70 millivolts. We're good with this. There's a lot more like tricky little bits there, but um, we're just gonna go through it. So, to get this resting membrane potential set up, um, you like, like the video just said, you need two things. You need uh, differences in ion concentrations, and then you need differences in how permeable the membrane is to those ion concentrations. So, you might have seen this before because this is the classic, um, it's the classic 
active transport mechanism in, in cells. It's called the sodium ATPase. Um, sorry, the, the, so, the, the sodium potassium pump is probably the, probably the best way to call it. What this pump does is it just chugs round the clock and it's pumping three sodiums out and two potassiums in every single cycle. It just does this nonstop unless you have certain toxins, in which case it, then it does stop and that's bad. So three sodiums out, two potassiums in, three sodiums out, two potassiums in, right? Um, which means you end up at the end of the day, you end up with a lot of sodium outside the law of potassium inside, right? But help me out here. If, you, if we're both, if, we're, if I'm pumping sodium out and pumping potassium in, yeah, I end up with lots of sodium on one side, lots of potassium the other place. But sodium and potassium are both positively charged. So how come it ends up negative inside? Right? Because because I'm so I guess I'm putting positives out, but I'm also pulling positives in. So how's the cell ending up negative? Yeah, because you're moving more positive ions out, right? I get three out for every two that come in. So I'm losing one every time, right? Do we all see that? So, um, this, this works around the clock, just all the time. But, and I don't know if this is the thing. Are any of you the clean ones in your apartment? Yeah? Okay. Where you might just, all the time, you're, you're forever putting dishes away, right? And as soon as you put them away, somebody comes, like, I don't know what they do, but they, like, lick on all the spoons or whatever. And you're like, just, just that, right? Okay. So then potassium pump working around the clock. But there also are um, leak channels in this thing, which means all the time, sodium some of it is just going to be leaking back in. So you're pumping it a bunch out, but there's a little bit trickling back in. Um, potassium, you're pumping, you're pumping in, but the membrane's really leaky to potassium. Potassium's going out quite a bit. So at the end of the day, you've got all these competing forces, um, but it balances out to a resting membrane potential. So. Yes, that's the same thing. Here's the picture. So th this fight, where you, it's not really a fight, but you, this pump, pumping sodium out, potassium in, and sodium potassium leaking across their channel, it stays relatively stable. And that evens out to, in a given cell, about negative 70 millivolts. Difference in charge. It can change really quickly, though, because as soon as you change the permeability of a membrane, you're going to change its voltage. You're going to change the voltage across it really fast. Theoretically, you could change that if you change. Okay, so you can change the concentrations of ion each side and how permeable the membrane is. These come. These changes come in two types. One type is called the gradient potential, and that's just going to be a signal that's going to operate over a short, short space. And you're also going to have an action potential, which is going to be a really, really long distance signal. And it will make more sense in a minute, I promise. This, the neuron uses these changes in voltage, or sorry, these changes in potential, to, to send signals, to receive signals, to integrate signals, and to send signals, which is phenomenal. Have I lost anybody yet? I feel like I'm losing people. Am I losing people? Hmm. I can't read people's faces very well. Okay, we'll see. Emily's not lost, but besides that, okay. <sighs> okay. You could, with, with a resting, so you've got resting membrane potential, right? You could either, if you're going to send a signal to it, you could either make the whole thing more polarized, which makes the whole thing less polarized, right? If you've got this, this potential difference between inside and outside, and it's negative 70 millivolts, you could change it to be negative. 90 millivolts, right? Or you could change it to be like, hmm, 
No, I want to bring it closer towards zero. I want to change the speed, I don't know, negative 40 millivolts. You can go either direction. If you make it so that the membrane is less negative than it used to be, it's called depolarization, because you're moving away from being polarized. So right, zero is zero here. You're at negative 70 resting membrane potential. If you make it so that that's less, you depolarize the neuron. It's going towards, it's going away from, away from zero. It's going to, towards non-polar, right? Hyperpolarization is when you do the opposite. And you're moving the other direction. So you make the membrane more negative than it used to be. What this sets up is the ability to, to well, you change, you change the membrane. You change the membrane potential. Typically when that happens, you have really short-lived little dinky changes. So right now, most, most of the cell right here um, is positively charged on the outside, negatively charged on the inside. But there's some stimulus that, boom, makes this um, negative on the outside, positive on the inside. That, that charge gets felt a little bit in both directions. Cool. That you can just set up by something that opens a gated ion channel. So say um, you, you were to open a so the sodium channels here. Sodium could then come in and then make it more positive than it used to be. This spreads, so if you, if you open up, say, say you opened up um, oh, a sodium channel here and positive charges flow in, the spaces on both sides that have membrane, they feel that charge. I mean, these things like sodium ions are, are physical entity, right? They feel that charge, and that goes in both directions. The current that flows when you do something like this is really fast, but also decays really, really quickly. So you depolarize one specific spot, places next to it feel it, but that signal drops off really quickly. So it doesn't last very long. You can't send a really long distance signal with this because it only because the signal decays really quickly. But good news. You can send really, really long signals but you don't do it that way. You do it by something called action potentials. Um, action potentials are amazing. They're, these signals, well, this is how the neurons are gonna send long distance signals. They happen in neurons, they also happen in one other cell type. Which cell type? Awesome. Yeah, okay. Um, when this goes down, the membrane potential is going to briefly switch. We'll see it. Action potentials don't decay over distance, meaning um, this, this signal back up here, this signal here, the signal strength where it happened is, I don't know, whatever it is, 40 or something, negative 40. By the time you get a few millimeters out to either side, it's gone. Action potentials, whatever that original strength of that signal is in the first place, even if you're, say, moving a meter along, so it's a really long neuron, that signal strength at the end is the same st signal strength. It doesn't decay. You see this? This is really important. What this requires is opening voltage-gated channels in a really specific order. And I think I hinted at this with muscles, but we're going to see it better here. Two types of channels that are opening. So the sodium-potassium pump is just working around the clock anyways. Great. That, that's establishing this. The leak channels are just doing their thing. That's establishing th this. The channels we care about for action potentials are going to be voltage-gated. So they're going to open in response to specific changes in voltage. And we care about two types of them. The sodium ones 
they're voltage gated, but they have two gates. Has anybody ever done this? Like, um, it's, it's called most cert with certain kinds of animal pens where you have two gates, where you have one gate that you go and you close it behind you, then you open the other gate and you can close it. Right, so you don't like let all the chickens out, whatever it is you do. Okay. Cilium channels are like this. At resting state, it's closed. Right? Resting state, say it's closed. This channel lets sodium through normally if, if it's open, but resting state, it's closed. If, the, if this inside membrane is negative, sodium cannot get through. Depolarization opens this. Actually, I don't have a name. It's just, it has to be depolarized. Depolarization opens this, and sodium can go through. So it has a closed state. It has an open state. It also has what's called an inactivated state. The inactivated state is when the voltage-gated part is open, but this little part of the protein, it, it looks like a little blob, plugs up the hole. Okay? So the way you get rid of this glob, so the glob plugs up the hole, the way you get rid of this glob is when this part of the protein um, flops back down, so if this goes back to being a um, resting state, the, the protein will, will come back down and that'll kick this the inactivation gate block out. Okay? That's the complicated version. Um, potassium channels are easy. They're either closed at resting state or depolarization opens them. Yeah? Um, sodium you're expecting to come in because there's a higher concentration of sodium outside and inside. Potassium you're expecting to go out because higher concentration um, inside and outside. We see this? This sets up everything. I've said this about several things. Okay. This is going to set up these action potentials. Um, it's an actively propagated change in the voltage of the membrane, yeah. um, meaning this voltage change keeps getting encouraged over and over again. You can either have it happen or not have it happen. You can't do, you can't change the strength of it. So like, when you're flipping on a light switch, you can either turn it on or not turn it on. Unless you have it on in dimmer. But we're just going to assume a normal light switch, right? Or if you're pushing like a button on a, on a flashlight, you can either push it with enough pressure to have it go completely or have it not go. Action potentials are all or none. You either have it happen or it doesn't. This is how it works. We're here at resting state. Outside, there's a lot of sodium. Inside, there's a lot of potassium. Sodium is closed because of um, its voltage-gated channel is closed. Potassium is closed because its voltage-gated channels are closed. And the inside's negative here, and the outside's positive. So far, so good? Great. Something then happens. If something occurs to, to depolarize this slightly, you can open a few sodium channels. So let's say there's some signal that comes on and adds a little bit of positive charge, right? You have a little bit of depolarization. Over here, we're looking at we're looking at the membrane potential here on the y-axis. And right down here, about negative 70, this was resting state, right? Do, 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 just resting state. Some initial depolarization causes a few sodium channels to open. So now this member potential got a little bit higher. If it gets high enough to hit something called threshold, um, you open up the sodium channels, right? So, so if you get enough to actually have these open and enough of them open, they open, and now sodium channels open really, really quickly. And you're right here. So, the if you're if you're recording the the voltage or you're, you're recording the potential here, um, it goes from being where it was negative just a moment ago. This is in milliseconds down here, where it used to be negative. 
little depolarization, hit threshold, and now sodium just pours in really, really fast. And you can see that membrane potential get positive. It goes from being negative 70 to being positive 40 like that, really fast. So sodium channels, they open in response to the change in voltage, right? So a um, little bit, the, the membrane got depolarized, the sodium channels open really fast, sodium pours in. Um, potassium channels open in response to voltage changes too, right? So you'd expect that this channel would be open, open and potassium would pour out, right? Like sodium got open. The problem is potassium physically takes longer to open. Like it's responding to the voltage change, but it's just a slower channel. So at this point, the permeability of the membrane, don't worry about this, but it's for me to remind you to tell you things. The permeability of sodium is way greater than permeability of, of potassium. So sodium can just come on in. Sodium's driving this, right? So now it got, it got um, really, really positive for a brief second. After a brief moment, and we're talking like a millisecond, sodium channels self-inactivate, meaning the little ball and change thing plugs back up. So sodium, if it could, would still pour it because there's a lot of sodium outside, not much inside, it would just keep going. But it can't because it's plugged. About this time, potassium has finally finished opening its little gate, like, oh gosh, it's finally gotten open. And it was open because of voltage, but it took it a second. And now potassium is going to pour out because there's more potassium inside than outside. Potassium's leaving. So this first bit, resting membrane potential, then we had where sodium was coming in. Sodium self-inactivated and potassium finally opened up. Potassium pours out. And so as potassium pours out, you drop that membrane potential back down, right? Because you're having positive charges go away. So it falls fast and it actually undershoots resting membrane potential because potassium doesn't care what the doesn't care about the cell as a whole. It's trying to reach its equilibrium. It keeps pouring out and it goes actually below, below that negative 70. And then over a little bit of time, um, with the pump leak channel, it evens back out to rest membrane potential. All right, here's the undershoot. Th this thing is called the undershoot where it went lower than it's supposed to be. You can also call it hyperpolarization. And then, at this point, you get, as this happens, you get back to normal because you, the voltage gated channels are now closed again because the inside's negative, the outside's positive, the channel's closed. Um, that closing the channels cleared the inactivation gate of the sodium channel block. And so you're back to where you were just a second ago. Is everybody okay with that picture? Do you want to see it big? I have a big for you. Here we go. So these are milliseconds, right? This action potential peak, you'll see that this shape, you'll see over and over. Again. This, this is the shape of the signal in neurons. You start at negative 70-ish, right? Um, a little bit of a signal, a little bit of a positive charge coming in someplace will push things towards threshold. If you get to threshold, if you get to um, about negative 50, you open these voltage-gated sodium channels, and then, and then you have to go. Once those sodium channels get open, once you hit threshold, you're going all the way. Like, you're not gonna, you can't stop halfway. Sodium comes in, whee! Sodium gates inactivate, Potassium comes out, woo, and then you reset. Great. I am so going to put some version of this picture on a quiz and be like, what is happening here? What's happening here? So let's try it briefly. Um, here at the purple part, 
do we have more sodium inside or outside of the cell, of the, of the membrane? Yeah, we've got more sodium outside, right? You okay with that? Cool. Um, how come, how come this is going more negative? Like, how, co how come, so it's positive here, how come it's going negative? Because potassium's leaving. Because potassium's leaving. Okay, pe people feel comfortable with this? You all are a smart class, like you're a quick class. Okay. So. Let's watch a video and then we'll talk about things. No, 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 no. Online people, it's the video link that's right there. We're gonna watch it here big. I realize it's gonna say the exact same thing I said, but you know, I like saying it. It makes me feel happy. I realize somebody else stole this too, probably, but. Neurons send signals over long distances by generating and propagating action potentials. Most action potentials originate near the axon hillock of the cell body in the initial segment of the axon. It then travels the entire length of the axon. A closer look reveals that during an action potential, voltage-gated channels open and close, altering the permeability of the plasma membrane to sodium and potassium ions. A threshold stimulus changes the shape of the voltage-gated sodium channels, causing their activation gates to open. This event marks the beginning of phase one of the action potential, known as depolarization. As sodium ions diffuse into the axon, the membrane potential becomes less negative. This causes more voltage-gated sodium channels to open, and the membrane potential soars to plus 30 millivolts. At this point, two key events occur. The inactivation gates of voltage-gated sodium channels close, and voltage-gated potassium channels open. These two events mark the beginning of phase two of the action potential, known as repolarization. As potassium ions diffuse out of the axon, the membrane potential becomes negative again. However, the membrane potential continues in the negative direction, going beyond the resting state of minus 70 millivolts. This marks the beginning of phase three of the action potential, known as hyperpolarization. During this phase, voltage-gated potassium channels close and all voltage-gated sodium channels are released from inactivation. By the end of this phase, ions move through leak channels only and the membrane potential returns to the resting state of minus 70 millivolts. The neuron is now ready to fire another action potential. Summary. Generation of an action potential. A threshold stimulus opens voltage-gated sodium channels. Sodium ions diffuse into the axon, depolarizing it to plus 30 millivolts. Voltage-gated sodium channels close, and voltage-gated potassium channels open. Potassium ions diffuse out of the axon, repolarizing it to a negative value. The membrane potential briefly hyperpolarizes. Voltage-gated potassium channels close, and the membrane returns to the resting state of minus 70 millivolts. Okay, so we feel comfortable with that idea? Yeah? It's one of those things like once one thing goes, the rest of the things fall, follow in, in response. And it ends in a cycle, so you end up back where you started. So, this picture right here has a lot going on. It is so not drawn to scale. 
This is the axon. Just for the record, like, it's very much fatter than it is in a normal cell. But we're going to look at it here. So we're going to start uh, on like people. Oh, I want to go play with the board. Okay. Um, let's start, we're, we're going to look at right here. So there's a threshold stimulus that makes it so that, so, so normally you're resting, you're resting membrane potential right here, right? Positive outside, negative inside. There's some stimulus that makes it so now we've got positive inside. Cool. As that happens, you've opened these voltage gated sodium channels, right? And so it goes positive in here. This positive part in here is felt by the next little portion down on the membrane, which is going to make it so that next portion, it opens its sodium channels, right? Because that, because it went positive, right? So this opens its, its voltage gated channels and it's gonna have sodium come in. So sodium's gonna come in, it's gonna open the next that that positive charge coming in is going to open the next one. It's going to open the next one. It's going to go all the way down. Do we see that? So as as positive charge comes into the first initial area, that positive charge is felt by the next portion of the membrane, causing those voltage gated channels to open. As that charge comes in, the next portion feels it and it just keeps going. This is what means by actively propagated. It means it keeps it keeps being pushed down the whole way. So, um, keeps going down the whole length of the axon. Um, it goes back to negative because things close. Because otherwise, um, if you have the inactivation gate of sodium, you just keep everything open, right? Because sodium comes in, it would, the signal would go both directions. But because you've got a physical close on the sodium channels, um, inactivation, the action potential can only go one direction. Does that make sense? Let's look at this right here. So, um, as sodium comes in, right, sodium coming in is going to make the next portion of the membrane feel more positive. It's going to open it up um, and it'll keep moving forward. That part's cool, right? The reason it doesn't go backwards is because um, right here, the sodium channels inactivate. So now the sodium channels are inactive, and even though the next portion of the membrane is positive, it can't open these back up because they're plugged. And so by the time they, by the time they, um, oh, de-inactivate, the signal's already gone. We're cool. Um, there's also a thing that to have an action potential go you need to have the membrane hit this threshold value. So you can't have another action potential fire when the um, sodium inactivation gates are closed because no matter how much positive charge you run in on this, you can't solve the problem because the problem isn't positive charge. The problem is the sodium channels are physically blocked and they're not getting unblocked until the membrane goes negative. So no matter how much, you just can't run another ash pitch. Well, there, there's, there's a time limit on how fast you can send these. Um, once you're down here in this hyperpolarization part, you could have another ash potential because your sodium inactivation has been cleared. But for that to happen, you need a strong enough signal to overcome both this and that. Or you have to be able to get up to the threshold. Um, these are called the refractory periods for neurons. Um, the absolute refractory period is the time that it cannot happen because you've got this inactivation gate going on. The relative refractory period is when, yeah, you could, but it's harder because of hyperpolarization. Let's watch this one. Neurons can see okay. Long distances by generating and sending electrical signals called action potentials. 
Most action potentials originate in the axon's initial segment, a region also called the trigger zone. During an action potential, voltage gated sodium and potassium channels open and close, thus altering the membrane's permeability to sodium and potassium ions. As these ions diffuse through the channels, the membrane potential changes. It depolarizes from the resting state of now, minus 70 stop. millivolts to a peak value of plus 30 millivolts, and then quickly repolarizes back to minus 70 millivolts after a brief period of hyperpolarization. In this topic, we explore, step by step, the events that occur as an action potential is generated in the axon's initial segment. Okay. That's, that's my case. Okay, so, we're doing okay? I realize you maybe have other things to care about than action potentials, but this, this is what makes neurons so special. It really, really is. Like, they're special for lots of reasons, but mostly this. So, not everything that's depolarizing to the neuron produces an action potential. For this action potential to actually go or fire, it's called firing, like, like you fire a gun, like boom, it goes, you have to reach threshold. And if it reaches threshold, then it's going to happen. So action potentials either go or they don't go. You can't have a partial action, action potential. Um, watch this one on your own if you want. Well, it's fine. Our video is helpful. Videos are helpful. Action potential. Oh, jeez. Sorry. Potentials propagate in a continuous fashion in unmyelinated axons. Once an action potential is generated in the initial segment of the axon, it propagates the entire length of the axon. Recall that a threshold stimulus causes voltage-gated sodium channels to open. The influx of sodium ions generates an action potential. It also establishes a depolarizing current that flows to the next segment and brings it to threshold. Voltage-gated sodium channels open, regenerating the action potential in this segment of the axon. Current flows from this segment and depolarizes the next segment to threshold, thus regenerating the action potential yet again. In this way, regeneration continues in one direction all the way down to the axon terminals. The basis for unidirectional propagation is revealed when we take a closer look. By the end of the depolarization phase of the action potential, all voltage-gated sodium channels inactivate and voltage-gated potassium channels open. These two events render this segment of the axon temporarily insensitive or refractory to another depolarizing stimulus. However, voltage-gated sodium channels in the downstream segment are closed and receptive to a depolarizing stimulus. Thus, propagation occurs sequentially down the axon to the axon terminals. In myelinated axons, action potential propagation is a bit different. Here they propagate in a saltatory or leaping fashion. The myelin sheath consists of multiple layers of tightly wrapped glial cell membrane. But this sheath is not a continuous one. Exposed areas of axonal membrane, known as nodes of Ranvier, occur at discrete intervals. Voltage-gated sodium channels are abundant in the nodes, but largely absent between nodes. So, action potentials are regenerated at each node, not in areas covered by the myelin sheath. However, the myelin sheath does provide the insulation necessary for the rapid spread of depolarizing current. And the sooner the nodes reach threshold, the faster action potentials propagate along the axon. Saltatory conduction is extremely fast. Velocities often exceed 100 meters per second. In contrast, continuous conduction is fairly slow. Velocities rarely exceed 2 meters per second. 
Nevertheless, both continuous and saltatory conduction propagate action potentials over varying distances, because action potentials regenerate along the way. Summary: Propagation of an action potential. Once generated, the action potential propagates the entire length of the axon without decrement. We're good? Yeah. Are these helpful? Okay. I do realize it makes your slides, like, ridiculously huge download. Eh. Okay. So. We have a problem now. Like, like, it's a good thing, but it's a problem. So, we have these action potentials. But they're all alike. They either happen or they don't happen. But maybe I want to send different signals. Maybe I want to say um, that I feel really strong about this. Maybe maybe this neuron's responding to say light or pressure. Let's let, let's have it be pressure, right? I want it to say I happen to feel a feather fall on my skin. It's different than oh my goodness, it's a moose stepping on me, right? Okay, so how is my neuron going to do that if it can only send one signal? I'm going to mess around with the lights. Online people, think about it, I'll come back to this. If I have a variable neuron up here, and I'm sending a signal, I'm going to send a variable neuron up here. The way neurons are going to handle this. So here's our picture. Um, a sub-threshold stimulus isn't going to generate an action potential at all. Not going to happen. It gets close to threshold, comes back down, no action potential. If it hits threshold, yeah, it's going to have action potentials. And these action potentials, whether it was a really, really strong stimulus, over here, strong stimulus, or fairly weak stimulus, the height of those action potentials, the same. But the stronger the stimulus, the more close together you're going to fire those action potentials. Um, when we're reading this chart, these blue lines here, it's firing an action potential. So you're recording the neuron and you're saying, okay, I'm timing over time, right? Action potential, action potential, action potential, none. Bunch, 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 bunch. We're good? Tell the difference there? The nervous system doesn't have to have different heights of action potentials to be able to code for stimulus intensity. It can, it can code for stimulus intensity just by, well, by how many neurons are active, but even with one neuron, by how often it's sending the signal. Questions? You can get it really, really close, but again, and I realized like three of the videos have now mentioned it, you can't have it be completely you can't have it be solid. You have to have breaks between these action potentials. You can't have them just constantly go. Um, you have to have them constantly go because of this, right? So this part is absolutely refractory. It's not going to find out action potential for anything. Relatively refractory, yeah, from, he okay, from here on out, you could, but you have to have a really, really strong stimulus for that to happen. Okay, we're good at that? Great. We might actually get done in time. Woo um, online people, think deep thoughts are about two minutes because we're doing an in-class demo, and I will come back to you just momentarily. And people who are in neuroscience, I'm sorry, I only have like a few demos I can think of, so, yeah. okay. We have a goal as a class now, because I just told you, so we do. Um, we're trying to get this ball from Brody all the way back to Logan, okay? So you can imagine that you, you as a class are an axon, so you're long, but instead of being straight, you're, you're snake-like, okay? 
So what's going to happen? Brody is going to throw it to Claire. <sighs> okay. Sorry. Brody's going to throw it to Catherine. Then to Claire. going to move on and then go back and you're going to snake it back and forth. Okay? You're going to throw it to the next person in line. Katie, you'll be throwing it. Do you prefer Kate or Katie? Kate, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just call everybody wrong names. Like Penelope. Okay, great. Um, Kate, we'll throw it to Logan, right? Yeah, okay. Good, this game. Okay. Um, and we're going to time it, all right? Everybody see who they're receiving it from, who they're sending it to? Okay. We got, we got this? does the same thing that, okay, so online people, what we did was we threw a ball along person, 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 right? And that took about 16 seconds. Um, but instead of throwing from every single person, if you throw it from the first person to the last person, it took about two seconds, okay? You can see how that's way faster. But Neuron has done the same thing that you all figured out. They're like, well, okay, if, if, we, if the goal is to get it from point A to point B, does everybody have to touch it? So, this is how this plays out. Um, action potentials, sorry, I'm abbreviating them at AP throughout just because I get tired of typing things. Um, action potentials are going to happen in the axons. Um, how fast this happens is related to two things. It's also related to temperature, but like you're always at body temperature, so that's not really an issue. Um, Axon diameter, you're going to have, um, oh, how, how fast this flows has to do with how fat the axon is. So really, really fat axons move um, the signal faster than narrow axons. Kind of like how if you're trying to get a bunch of water down a hose, a really fat hose will get water through it faster than a really, really tiny hose. But that's not, it's sort of important, but doesn't come up that much in humans. Um, the one that really speeds things up is myelination. So, lots of words here, but we're just going to talk about pictures, and this is for your study. Three different pictures going on here, okay? Um, this middle one is what just a continuous action potential looks like. So, we're at, an ax we're at the axon. We have the stimulus, right? This positive charge comes in through um, sodium channels, right? So um, that sodium channel got, got opened. Um, there's positive charge. That positive charge opens the next sodium channel. Positive charge comes in, opens the next sodium channel. Positive charge comes in all the way down the membrane, right? That's very similar to 
one person catches the ball, hands it to the next person, catches the ball, hands it to the next person, right? All the way along. We're good? Um, which is great. I mean, and this is just a function of the physics of the situation, right? So um, as positive charge comes in here, the next place in the membrane that can feel positive charge and that, that can, um, that has these voltage gated ion channels, they respond, right? This, it's reasonably fast, but comparatively slow because it takes a while for these things to happen. A faster version is this. This is a neuron that's myelinated. So not all neurons are myelinated, but ones that are have these big fat myelin sheaths over them. So these glial sheaths that you can't move charge across them because you physically can't. You've blocked it. Remind me what time we get out? 40, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Just watch the clock there. Um, you physically can't move charge across this because it's like, you know, covered in fat. Ions are not going to flow across this space. So what happens is a stimulus comes in here, and instead of going, instead of that um, potential slowly tricking, trickling down the whole membrane, it's the thing where you basically just chuck it to the next spot that can, that can respond. So you have a stimulus. This myelin sheath prevents anything from opening or closing. There, there are no um, voltage-gated channels right here. It jumps to here. The, the, signal, the signal jumps, jumps, jumps. It's called saltatory conduction because if you're recording voltages, for all the world, it looks like it's hopping the whole way down. Do you see that? Could you imagine a scenario where um, if you had a class of like 300 people and we were trying to do, the, and you were all lined up and you're trying to throw that fairly light little aluminum ball, it'd be a problem to jump from one end all the way to the other? Cause just because you couldn't throw it hard enough? You okay with that? The accent has the same problem, that you can't have it go, you can't have a signal jump the entire length, typically, because it lose steam. So you have these, they're called nodes of Ranvier, um, or myelin sheath gap, gaps, where the charge gets reset, right? So you throw it, you throw it, you throw it. Does this make sense? See the picture? Um, so that's how you propagate a signal along an axon. Dendrites and the cell body of the neuron itself, the stimulus comes, and because you don't have all these beautiful um, voltage-gated sodium potassium channels doing all their funky things, the voltage comes in and it dies off very quickly. But the, those changes in voltage are felt by other parts of the cell, and that becomes important because these sum together to tell the cell body something. Questions. If you have this picture down, you have most of this down. Yeah. Well, let me see how many slides we have. Yeah, we're still on thank you. We are on slide 48 of 78, but I knew we weren't getting through all of them, but I got excited. Um so myelination's great. It doesn't happen in everything, like not every axon needs to be myelinated, but you have tons of myelinated fibers. Um, and MS is a problem here with this. It's where the auto, so where the immune system goes for the myelin. Um, and then, then the timing of neural signals is off. And that can cause some serious problems. Um, often, it causes problems with vision. It can also cause lots of problems with like motor control. Like you're trying to do something, something with fine motor control, and the timings just are all off. Um, it's it's a problem. There's not actually a good cure yet, but it's something to look for. Thoughts, comments. This one's a nasty one. Honestly, though, lots of things in the nervous system are like ooh, ooh kind of rough, but. It's way more cheerful. Uh, you know Dr. Schultz, right? Most of you? Okay. Um, I've talked about nervous system stuff before. 
And in humans, that's actually a little bit more cheerful because apparently for most, say, let's say you have a horse or something, for most animals, nervous system problems are like, well, say goodbye to your beloved animal. For humans, it's like, okay, we're going to see what we can do. And yeah, I covered for his class once a while ago. Um, and I was looking up like neural diseases in horses. I was looking for treatments because like human diseases, most of them have at least some treatments that can help a little bit. And all of them are like, yeah, we don't, we don't treat that. We, we, we try to prevent it, but if it happens, nope. Which was kind of depressing. I mean, I get why, because it's, it's, it's the nervous system is tricky in many ways. Um, okay, so on happy note of multiple sclerosis, we're going to stop, because, yeah, it's time. You have lab today, I will, people who, people for whom labster is causing serious problems, talk to me in lab, we're going to figure something out. I don't know what, but something. I will try to figure something out before lab. Also, if you sent me an email and I've ignored you, I'm not trying to ignore you, just send it to me again. I'm trying, but I think I might have missed an email or two.